The past 12 months have been a remarkable time to run a precious metal miner. The gold prices hit records in a number of currencies, and now copper is nearing all-time highs. I'm with Mark Bristow, CEO of Barrick Gold. Mark, welcome to Keiko. Hello, Michael. Can you highlight your Q1 for us? Yeah, uh, really a, a, a good start to the year on the back of a challenging year last year, but a, a very good year, you know, record on everything uh, in 2020, uh, coming out on the back of that, um, you know, uh, now we've got real money, net cash, $500 million. Copper, as you said in your introduction, a big contributor to our performance this uh, this quarter, we do produce a, a substantial amount of copper, 20% on a gold equivalent ounce basis, that the revenues from our copper mines were up 31%. We beat consensus. Um, and, you know, we've had uh, nine weeks in, a, in, in, in the game uh, since we started on, after the merger with Rand Gold. We've beat consensus seven times and met it twice. So, you know, all around um, a, a pleasing start to the year. We, we're very comfortable about our guidance for the full year after the first three months. Can you talk about uh, that copper exposure? You're a copper bull going forward and then you're interested in Barrick. What is going to be exposure? So I've always been a copper bull, as you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you call it that, but, I, you know, the reality, if you want to become, if you want to maintain relevance as a gold miner, you've got to take on bigger and bigger assets. As you know, we are very clear about our preferred tier one uh, portfolio, and that's a 500,000 ounce of producer of gold production for more than 10 years. And to keep it that size, you very quickly have to move towards the porphyries and that's that's where copper comes into play because porphyries are gold copper porphyries or more than often copper gold porphyries and if we want to stay relevant and it's so important i think we've demonstrated it so as newmont the importance of being relevant in this modern world uh, uh, to attract uh, genuine investments um and so you know, we are 20% now. We've never really tried to balance a number because, as you've seen with this rise in the copper price, as as a decade ago when that happened last, the copper, the dominant copper producers ended up with premium, very similar to the gold industry on a bull market. So, um, so it, and 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 I've always said. If you run great businesses with good margins focused on high quality assets run by best in class people, you always attract a premium and it doesn't have to be a resource company. It's any company that does that. Can, uh, can you discuss uh, Donlin in Alaska and what's your next steps? Yeah, so Donlin has been a, a great journey for, for me personally because, you know, my, the whole sort of foundation of, of how I look at value is built on all bodies because as a miner, that prescribes the revenue. You know, you can't, I always say, you can't put gold in the ground. It's only God who does that. <laughs> um, we've got to find it and value it, but it's certainly those all bodies set the, the, the potential revenue from mining and Donlin is a massive resource, and what we set out to do after the uh, merger with Rangold is to work with Nova Gold and say, let's understand the ore body so that we can uh, decide on what is the maximum revenue stream that we can get out of mining it. Once you've done that, then you can look at the sizing and the, the final capital that you can risk on that basis. Of course, you choose the gold price. Um, and we've made enormous progress to get there. Um, this, you know, we've shared with the market how we progressed and, and uh, now rather than having a statistical uh, gross estimate, we're starting to put the gold into proper geological units 
um, so that we can determine the size and the mining equipment and simulate the mining rate and what we can do realistically. And and on that and we now have a drilling program. We've already started this summer drilling program, and and we believe that takes us, as I've said in 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 our our note. It takes us to a point where we can, we believe we can then uh, really plot the um, the next steps in uh, in the um, uh, Donlin um, progress, effectively. But it's a it's a huge resource, you know, well north of thirty million ounces. You had a lot in your Q1 about ESG. Now, when I'm looking at uh, Q1s, it's easy to run financials and look at comparisons amongst the companies. But how do you run comparisons uh, with companies in their ESG efforts? So, you know, it's something that I, when when I started Rand Gold Resources, you know, it was really the very foundation of how we were able to build a premium mining company, gold mining company in sub-Saharan Africa, because there is nothing there to sort of hang on. You've got to build everything yourself. And and more importantly, you've got to, you've got to earn your license to operate, which, you know, again, the African Middle East region of Barrick is still a very important region for us, and it has potential to f- grow further. So, and, and ESG is is really, in, our, in Barrick, we call it sustainability, because, it you know, and certainly in this modern world, if you're really serious about being a mining company for the future, you have to be sustainable. To be sustainable, you've got to be acceptable to future generations. And it's a big challenge that our mining industry in general faces because, you know, historically, um, Michael, you've often heard this even with investors. They say, oh, I've got this person who knows that person who can get you a special deal. And it's been exploitative. But mining really, when you boil it down, uh, contrib- is is a, an enabler of more than 45% of the global economic activity. So, you know, and it's the most unloved industry around. Um, and so how do you make it, how do you p- position it so that it is acceptable, particularly to future generations? It's a big employer. It employs highly skilled people. It pays really well. It makes a real difference in parts of the world where no mainstream industry goes. Um, and so integrated, and it's, and by the way, you know, when you go back to remember the safety, you will remember that the safety issues and the, the whole argument about how you report safety and why safety is important. And ESG is, is, is becoming that same challenge. And, to answer your specific question, Barrick was the first mining company to introduce and publish a scorecard, a what we call a um, ESG scorecard or a sustainability scorecard, and we did it uh, based on, of course, G and uh, GRI in 2019, and also our peers. And this year, we've just published the 2020 sustainability report and we included then SAPSI, um, the SAPSI framework as well because again we it's not about trying to tick boxes it's about we want to be there and we want people to want to work for us we want host countries to want to have us in their country um, and and again we want investors to want to own us rather than just trade us and so that whole sort of more modern approach is something that we as an industry really need to work harder at. And again, people forget, you know, some fund managers are so quick to say, I want the dividend, I want this. But then they get very um, sort of agitated when the countries in which we operate make the same demands. And so, you know, mining is about partnering capital uh that's in in the form of money, investments, human capital, the people, and and uh, and um, and governments, and we are all stewards of some components of that partnership. The fund managers, of course, stewarding those investments. Um, the governments being stewards of uh, the uh, national resource endowment for not only today but future generations. 
and their own uh, electorate, their constituents. And then of us in the mining industry, we're that middle person who manages that partnership. If we do it well, we'll earn our license to operate. If we do it badly, we become unwanted citizens. So I think that's the debate that we need to, and that's what we and Barrick are trying to, to, to facilitate rather than just create another set of compliance. You know, everyone's got little compliance, ICMM, World Gold Council, this person, that person, BlackRock, everyone's created their own sort of box ticking exercise. And I think it's a much more coherent um, a purpose that we all need to uh, invest in, I think. Speaking of sustainability, uh, there has been a lot of uh, efforts uh, towards getting to uh, zero carbon. You've had your own goals at uh, Barrick. Um, look, it's still a legacy operation. These are massive operations. They have a massive energy input uh, that they need for going forward. So what can you do? Uh, you know, how realistic is it to kind of get th these operations down to some type of carbon neutrality? So, um, so promises don't work. <laughs> That's one thing we've got to start with. So it's about plans. And right now we have many uh, different uh, scenarios that we have to plan around. Of course, our youngest mine is Kibali and DRC, where Rand Gold built uh, you know, a very interesting new world style of power generation supported by uh, a base hydro generation. We've just introduced the first real big batteries to add to that. And then we, our last resort is uh, high spinning diesel generators, which during most of the year st are in standby. There's, of course, all the renewable energy sources uh, today, apart from hydro, are not continuous. So, but it, for me, it's fascinating when you see how when you demand something, people start being innovative. And, and you know, there's, and I always say to my team, if you don't measure it, you can't improve it. So it's good to start the measurements. And then, you know, you've seen the debate about decarbonization. You know, again, you know, everyone, all the sort of um, immediate demands were, oh, let's just throw out coal and throw out uh, you know, hydrocarbons. and But now people are starting to think about how do you capture that carbon after you've combusted the, that uh, energy source? Because that's more continuous. And remember, the majority of the world is not developed yet. And if you want to have a planet that survives for mankind, you've got to reinvest and develop those emerging markets and developing world and even the ones that are not even in that category. And if we don't do that, we'll end up driven by poverty, um, even though there might be the wool in the developed world to do something different. So uh, for me, <clears throat> this is the start. And I think a lot more uh, <clears throat> responsibility and a little less hysterics would probably get us further. Um, but it is, I must say, <clears throat> excuse me, encouraging to see a, a certain seriousness now on r recognizing we have to do things differently. And by the way, in every one of our minds, we've got um, champions and, and plans around, even if we just reduce uh, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions a little bit every day or even every week, we get somewhere. And if you and it's like uh, it's like the environment. If you teach management and demand that they respond in a responsible manner as though it was their own backyard, you start seeing activities. And that and I think we will get there. Um, we'll certainly get a lot better than what we are. You've been very good on gold when you're modeling it. You say one thing that happens with it. When you have these price spikes, it will settle at a new level. Uh, where are we right now with gold and where do you see it going forward? So I don't think we are at the right level right now, given the uncertainty and the, um, the damage that has been done in the global economy. 
And it's, you know, we've we've got a such a distorted global economy. We had one before this pandemic broke. As you know, the gold price was rising all the way through 2019. People were talking about all bubble scenarios. There was a lot of concern, and then the pandemic came. Now, now we've got uh, we sort of uh, uh, over the hump to say um, everyone's assuming we're going to go back to utopia, but there's a lot of damage. And the scary part, Michael, is the people who couldn't afford to lose jobs lost them, and the people who could afford to to survive without a job just ended up with more money. And you saw, I don't know if you saw just recently that some of the banks saying they they can't take any more deposits because they got so much money. And But the whole global economy is now distorted. And how do we reestablish that? And, and, and on top of that, you know, post the global financial crisis, we saw this emergence of uh, popular, pop, popular politics. And, and, and that has really en- enhanced the... Uh, the disparate situation uh, on a financial basis or on a a global economic basis. So I think there's a lot of work uh, to be done um, in in establishing um, the, the, the balance. Because right now, if you look at the total global debt, it exceeds the total GDP. Now that, uh, to an accountant, is impossible. So some are, something's going to have to happen, and we're still carrying some of this toxic debt on balance sheets from the global financial crisis. So, so and gold measures that uncertainty and uh, and 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 risk in in in, in and, and and it's high now, but it should be higher in my mind. And if you look at post. The global financial crisis, it took a couple of years to measure the impact, 2011 following the 2009, 2008, 2009 crisis. And it, and it lasted on a sort of sawtooth plateau for two and a half, nearly three years. Um, so we're, we've gone up to 2000. Uh, we're back down at 1700. I think the long term value of the dollar is probably around $1,500 gold price. Um, at this stage, because we we came from sort of 250 to 450 to 1200, and this is just on the back of quantitative easing, you know, significant devaluation of paper money. Um, and but again, I think the the premium against the base, the new base that you and I have spoken about represents uh, the the chaos in in the global economy and I think that's that delta is still a little too too small right now is gold losing mind share to crypto and also is there a better job needed for doing the marketing of gold uh, versus uh, Bitcoin you know um, <laughs> it's an interesting debate um, <laughs> you know I uh, you know um, I, I, I don't believe crypto works. Uh, you know, the, the original logic of taking a whole lot of energy and converting it into some sort of um, blockchain and that has value, um, maybe. And the idea was it was unique and there were only going to be so many. But now you see all these cryptocurrencies arriving. And I, and again, you know, the the question of this excessive amount of uh, free cash in the hands of people who don't really need it have distorted the markets, and I, you know, I absolutely believe that. And I mean, we we got the S and P trading at you know an all time high, but the underlying economics financials don't support it. Um, you know, at least the gold industry we make real money now, which is a good change. Um, so. For me, um, gold, the point you make about gold is it's still hard to own gold to trade it. The ETFs were a big boon to our industry. You know, a lot of miners felt that it would impact negatively on the equity. It, completely the opposite. It grew the industry. It made it more transparent. It allowed people to trade. And and we in the World Gold Council, along with some of the other big uh, institutions like the LBMA, we understand that, and and for the and what this has really brought us 
I mean, the cryptocurrencies and the other sort of competing options have forced us to realize we need to work harder um, to create a fungible um, uh, form of, uh, of gold and allow every person in the world to access it and use it and pay, use it to pay things. And we can also identify it, certainly along the, you know, using uh, blockchain technology, which is, certainly has its uses. And again, you know, the other part of that is illegal metals uh, fuel uh, these unprecedented outbreaks of, um, you know, war and, and, and abuse of humanity around the world today. And, and again, a good discipline on making sure that we understand the source. And, and that, as you know, is, is, a, is a part of the governance part of ESG as well. So, you know, I, I, on your first part of the question, absolutely, you know, we've got a lot to do to, to, to again, grow our relevance uh, within the global economy. Um, on the cryptocurrency side, I'm not sure that that is something that, and again, you know, we want every bit of the energy that's available to use to develop this planet, not pump up a sort of abstract currency. I think there's a very real place for uh, central bank cryptos, um, uh, uh, and that we're already seeing happening because, you know, again, today, such a little part of every transaction in the world is actually done with paper money. So that, that and, and I think regulation is important uh, in any global uh, financial structure. And, and we'll see that regulation guide this uh, back to some sort of normality. Mark, thank you for speaking with Kitco. Thank you, Michael. Always I've been speaking with Mark Bristow. He is CEO of Barrett Gold. My name is Michael McCray. You're watching Kitco Mining.